let's begin our call to worship from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 through 14. If you turn your back, excuse me, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and He will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce our first hymn. First hymn this morning, number 683. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, number 683, and we'll stand to sing. Yeah. 
from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe one more holy Catholic and apostolic church, who acknowledged one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Your faith has made you well. 
Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so we must approach God in 
the name of Jesus because that reflects our willingness to obey Christ even in this matter. We also come in the name of Christ uh, showing confidence on His promises. Christ has taught us that we can have confidence that our prayers will be answered. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. We bring our request based on the promises of Jesus, of an answer. And we pray through confidence in what He has said. So prayer is an expression of faith in the Word of Christ. Confidence in His ability to hear and provide intercession for our prayers. In particular, we ask in Christ's name for mercy. Now that might strike your attention as a rather brief and short description of our prayers. We often think of prayers as petitions for help and assistance and this and that, prayers for worship and praise, uh, these kinds of things. Here, the Catechism focuses on the idea of mercy. We approach God, our Father, in the name of Christ for mercy. Really, everything that we have from the Father is grounded in God's mercies towards us. We do not have a right to hear or to gain a hearing God's presence. We don't have a right to any blessings from Him. Everything that He shows to us is grounded in mercy. And mercy is extended to us through Jesus Christ. And so when we approach God we pr in prayer, we cry out for mercy for Jesus' sake. Jesus died for us. He shed His blood for us. Therefore, we cry out for mercy. That mercy would attend our every day. And guide us in mind. We ask for mercy for Jesus' sake. He deserves to have us uh, in His service receiving mercy because He has suffered for us. He Himself has been glorified for our sake. When we ask things from our Father in the name of Jesus, we do not barely mention the name of Christ as though it's a ritual or something that we just do as a matter of habit or as though it's a magical talent that we can use in the presence of God. Pray in Jesus' name and things will happen. Uh, that doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, we, Jesus himself taught us not to pray uh, over and over again or in a mindless fashion. We should pray intelligently. And so prayer in Jesus' name is not something that's a mere habit. So we don't pray by a bare mentioning of his name, but we draw our encouragement to pray through Christ. He is the one who motivates us to pray. We have the desire to see His kingdom advance, His name glorified, so we are encouraged to pray through Him. Through Him we have boldness, strength, and hope of acceptance in prayer. Uh, Christ is the one who opens the way into the presence of a holy God, and sinners may approach a holy God in confidence uh, because of what Christ has done. You might recall the old covenant when the worshipers would try to approach God, if someone approached God in an improper way, they would be struck dead. We cannot simply go into the presence of God without Christ, but with Him we can go with boldness. Finally, uh, we approach God uh, with all these things through Christ and His mediation. He is our high priest who intercedes for us. So, do you pray in the name of Jesus? Uh, some in our military would tell chaplains no longer to pray in the name of Jesus because it mixes church and state. Well, if you've got chaplains in the service of the military, is that not already a mixture of church and state? And if you look at the history of our country, there have been constant prayers from the very beginning of our republic in Jesus' name. There have been declarations by the Continental Congress and presidents and so forth for God's mercies through Jesus Christ. For the military to ask our chaplains not to pray in Jesus' name is to take out from underneath them the very ground and reason for prayer. There is no prayer apart from Jesus Christ. There is no answer to prayer apart from prayer in His name. 
to remove the name of Jesus from prayers in the military is to leave the military without a prayer. It's a dangerous thing. You want to see the nature of that danger? Look at our public schools that have eliminated prayers from them a long time ago. And look what you see there. We pray in Jesus' name because it is in Jesus' name we have confidence of acceptance before God and confidence for answers to our prayers. The Lord commands us in His Word to speak to yourselves or speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If you open your hymnal to number 77, you'll notice in the up above the hymns, on the right hand side, there's a tune name. Uh, for instance, on 77 in the third tune, the tune name is Primon, or Primon. And then under that, you have a name, Jesse Seymour, who is the composer, and then under that, it's harmonized by the preacher. And on the left, you would have the author of the text of the hymn. Now in this case, you see Psalm 23. One of the things that I love about our Trinity hymnal is that it makes great use of the Psalms of Scripture. And so if you ever want to look through and find the Psalms that are in our hymn book, just look in that left-hand corner and look for Psalm 23 or whatever the Psalm is. Look on the page before that and see Psalm 138, Psalm 86, and Psalm 91. So, it integrates a psalter within uh, the hymns and the other spiritual songs that we sing. That's just for your edification. So we'll sing Psalm 23 in the third tune, number 77, and we'll stand to sing.
truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this full. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Father, we too would be blind except by your Spirit who open our hearts and our minds to see and perceive the truths of your Word. We pray that we would not be like many in Jesus' day whose hearts were hardened and were blind to the truths of Scripture, but we pray that your Spirit would work in each heart here, that we would receive the truth of your Word and rest in Christ, trusting in Him as our Good Shepherd. We pray that you would minister to our spiritual needs this morning by your grace through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Do any of you have a blue tooth? No, I don't mean a blue tooth. I recently had some work done on my tooth, and my gums were a little blue, perhaps after that, but a blue tooth is a hearing device that mates up with your smartphone, so that when you receive a phone call on your smartphone, your blue tooth, like a hearing aid, sounds for you, it rings, and you can answer the phone on the Bluetooth and speak through the Bluetooth, through your phone, to the party who's calling you. It's a pretty amazing device. When you think of it, let's suppose we have an audience that have multiple smartphones here. Sometimes we find that out when the phones begin to ring <laughs> in the service. But if your phone rings, my Bluetooth will not pick up the message on your phone. My Bluetooth only listens to my phone. There's that connection between the two of them. Whenever I turn the Bluetooth on, I hear a pleasant woman's voice saying, authoring hi. 
which means that it is authorizing the connection with the smartphone, and then the sound level is high, giving me a warning if I need to turn it down. Well, my hearing is such that I need it high, usually. In any case, there's this match. If you sit down at your computer, in the past we had to type out our messages on the computer, and the computer would, of course, record what we would type. But you know, of course, that today there is voice recognition software so that you can sit down on your computer and just speak to your computer, and the computer will type for you the message that you wish to deliver. So now you can speed your way through email messages, through notes and documents and so forth, through this speech recognition or voice recognition software. The computer hears your voice and writes out what you had to say. Pretty amazing stuff. Many ways in which this voice recognition is used in crime situations. The FBI uses voice recognition to determine whether uh, there is a voice match between somebody speaking and the criminal. A few years back when they were listening in to Osama bin Laden, they had a voice print of uh, his messages. And whenever a message would be transmitted by Al-Qaeda, they would compare the message to be sure the voice was authentic. They were listening for the true voice. Faith in Jesus Christ does not make use of technology. We don't need Bluetooth technology. We don't need voice recognition software. We don't need an FBI program to determine whether there's a, a criminal match. We simply listen to what Jesus has to say through his word. God's people hear the voice of Christ speaking in scripture, speaking through the preached word, and they respond accordingly. They know that voice and they follow after him. Jesus makes use of this of an analogy that was very familiar with the, the Jews of his day of the shepherd and his sheep. Now the shepherd would walk into a fold which had multiple flocks within that one large sheep fold. And he would call out his sheep by name. Out of the midst of that large uh, roaming flock of sheep, he would call out his own particular flock and they would go with him out into the fields to be fed. And Jesus says, just as the shepherd and the sheep know each other, the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and respond and follow out with him. So it is in his own relationship with his disciples. His true disciples hear and understand that which he has to say. They listen to the voice of Jesus and respond to that voice. Now he makes use of this analogy in the context of his work in healing a man who was blind from birth. In the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus comes across a man who is born blind. There's a discussion about that. He's healed. And then afterwards, this blind man is brought before the Sanhedrin and is tried because he was found walking with his mat on the Sabbath. And so the question becomes, who healed you? And he says, well, it was uh, somebody I don't know, but uh, he's a prophet from God. Well, he's driven out of the synagogue. Jesus meets with him, and he reveals himself to him as the one who healed. And then Jesus gets into a conversation with the Pharisees about blindness and hearing. And this is what the context is for this 10th chapter, where Jesus makes use of this analogy of the shepherd and his sheep. And he's arguing for the fact that while the sheep hear his voice, those who are not his sheep will not hear, listen, or respond. And that's why the Pharisees, these teachers of the law of Moses, do not come to Christ, because they are not among Christ's sheep. They do not have God's work of election in their hearts to draw them to Christ. When you listen to this conversation about the shepherd and the sheep, and the, this voice recognition that you find there, 
we see a variety of elements that are revelatory with regard to our salvation. Jesus uses this analogy to teach us some things about his great work of salvation. One of which is, again, this idea of an election. A particular people of God who are set apart in eternity past for Jesus Christ. You know, there are a variety of discussions about this sheepfold and the particular image that Jesus has in mind. Now, Jesus has multiple images here. He's the shepherd, and then he's the gate for the sheep, and there are different images that fit this. But at least one of these is, a, is the image of a sheepfold, perhaps in the city context, where the sheep are gathered together in this large fold. And the idea is that here is Judaism, the people of that day. And Jesus comes into the fold of Judaism and calls out a particular group of people to himself. Not all will respond to the truth of the gospel message. Only some will respond. And that is rooted in God's work of election. God chooses a people for himself out of all Judea. And these will truly respond to Christ. Even though even the Pharisees and the teachers of the law reject Christ for themselves, the elect will respond. They are Christ's sheep. They hear his voice. They listen to him. They know their shepherd. We have here what the Puritans of old used to describe as particular atonement or particular redemption. Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. Not for all men in general, not for everyone in all of humanity, but for his sheep. It is for those whom the Father has given to him that he lays down his life. It is these who respond to his voice when he calls them to go with him. So it is in your life, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's not because you were smarter than others, or that you made a wise choice per se, but it's because God by His grace drew you to Christ. He gave you a new heart, eyes to see, ears to hear, and you recognized the voice of your Lord and Savior and you responded to that voice. Christ died for his sheep. He laid down his life for you. Thereby he shows himself to be your good shepherd. Particular atonement, particular redemption. Christ sacrificing himself for his people. We also see here, in speaking of God's work of grace, the idea of a substitute, or one who laid down his life for his disciples. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for these people, for these sheep. He dies for them. Now, look at how he describes this death. It is one which is voluntary on his own part. He receives a mission from the Father and he voluntarily accepts it. That mission is to go into this world and to lay down his life as a sacrifice for sinners, for his sheep. Jesus comes into this world and he says, I freely lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I give it of my own accord. This will be important for the disciples to hear when they see Jesus being uh, uh, taken away by the soldiers at night and brought into the Sanhedrin and then brought before Pilate and then hearing the crowds cry out, Crucify Him! Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. He was not the victim of forces that were beyond him, of which he had no control. Even in that moment, he could have walked away. He was the Son of God. As Jesus said to uh, Pontius Pilate, I could call out for legions of angels at this moment. He freely gave up his life for his sheep. He was a voluntary sacrifice for sin. Jesus died for you freely because he wanted to. His death was an, an atonement for sin. It was on your behalf. It was a substitutionary atonement. The image of shepherd and sheep has a great history in the Old Covenant, most especially in Isaiah chapter 53, where we have the Lamb of God 
who gives his life for others. Of course, John the Baptist in the Gospel of John begins by calling people's attention to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came into this world for the sake of making a sacrifice, a substitutionary atonement. And when modern folks reject the idea of a substitutionary atonement, of Christ dying in my place, they lose all hope of the forgiveness of sins. Of course, they question whether there are any sins that they really need to be bothered with. So they, they couch themselves in this realm of uh, safety where they don't feel that they need a sacrifice for sins. Do you see that they are blind to the work of Christ? They're in the sheepfold, not necessarily of Judaism, but outward Christianity. But they do not hear the voice of the Savior who calls them to follow Him. The one who would lay down His life for them. It was necessary for their salvation that He die for them. There could be no salvation apart from them. Jesus then is this good shepherd who calls his own sheep by name. He knows you individually. He speaks to you separately. With all your quirks, all your background, all your uh, things that make up you, he knows you. And he calls you to himself. He's your good shepherd. The hirelings are not interested in well-being of the sheep. These are those who uh, preach uh, a false Christ or who say there is no need for this Jesus, who speak of a way of salvation by good works. We don't need to enter into the presence of God or into the church of Christ through the gate, through Jesus Christ. We can enter through another way, by living a good life, by doing good works. These are false shepherds. And they lead you astray. Christ is that good shepherd who feeds his flock. One of the blessings that we have with Jesus as our good shepherd is that he leads us out into the pastures. We can come in and out and enjoy the blessings of God, the life that he provides. Jesus says, I have come that they might have, have life and have it abundantly. This is what Jesus offers to you today. Abundance of life. Freedom from guilt, freedom from corruption and sin and all of its uh, damning influences. Freedom from oppression and sin. The hope of everlasting life, this is what Jesus brings to you. And he brings you life that affects you even now. A new heart, a new direction in life. All this comes from the good shepherd. Jesus is that one. Well, do you hear his voice? He calls to you through the preaching of his word. He instructs pastors and teachers to proclaim that word. The Gospel of John ends with Jesus speaking with Peter, who fell by his sin of denying Christ. And Jesus restores him and then says to Peter, Feed my lambs. Three times he says it to Peter and calls into his ministry. And Peter would go on to address the elders to, to shepherd those who are under their care. Paul would also address the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 to shepherd the flock of God that's been entrusted to their care. Pastors and elders should be those who shepherd the flock by leading them to the Savior Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who can care for them. There's no other way. There's no, no other hope. So that is our calling, to point people to Jesus Christ. Not only do pastors and elders have that responsibility, but husbands shepherd their families. They lay down their lives for their wives in Ephesians chapter 5. They speak the truth of God to their family. Husbands, be a shepherd to your family, to your wife and your children. Lead them in the pastures of God's word. Teach them God's will. Point them to the only Savior from sin, Jesus Christ. We are to be shepherds under the great shepherd, Jesus Christ.
And all of us have a responsibility to care for those who are entrusted to us. Sunday school teachers, mothers with children, teach those who are underneath you. Point them to Jesus Christ. He is your good shepherd. Will you listen to him? Will you respond? I sometimes wonder whether my dog Duke will respond to me. I call him to come and he sits there and looks at me and says, okay, what for? <laughs> I think sometimes if I ever got into a, a, a contest with a stranger and somebody was trying to determine who was the proper owner of Duke, he would probably run past me and go right to the stranger because that's more interesting. And he'd be wagging his tail like it was a long lost friend. But I know a way to get Duke to hear me and to listen. Do you want some bread? <laughs> he responds to bread and he comes. And I offer him something. Jesus is the bread of life. Come to him and be satisfied. Listen to his voice as he calls you out from this world. Follow him that you might have life. He is the true shepherd. Rest in him. That's right. Father in heaven, we thank you for our Savior and for his work on our behalf. And we pray that we would respond to his gracious work by living for Him, following after Him, listening to His voice. We ask for Your blessing in Jesus' name. Let's respond to the ministry of God's Word by giving ourselves and our offerings to the Lord at this time.
Father in heaven, we thank you for our Savior who leads us in the paths of righteousness. We thank you for his goodness and grace in providing for us and for all of our needs. We have every motivation to live for you and to serve you and walk in your paths. And yet we fall far short of your perfect standards. We fall far short of what we owe to you as our creator and especially as our redeemer. We pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us for all of our many sins. Forgive us for our sins against each other and our sins against you. We pray that you would grant us grace that we might live more faithfully before you, serving you all our days, that we might be a glory to your name, pleasing in your sight, receiving your blessing and your favor. And so we ask for the forgiveness of our, our sins through Jesus Christ and his mediation. In whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive us as we confess our sins to him in these words through the Apostle John. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Father in heaven, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have in Christ our Lord. We thank you that uh, by your Spirit you wash away these sins with Christ's blood. And we pray that your Spirit would renew us with grace and strength. Help us to develop those habits of righteousness that are pleasing in your sight. We pray that you strengthen us to that end, that we might be a glory to your name. We thank you for Christ's mission, that how he was not simply concerned to rescue those who were the children of Abraham among Israel, but he also rescued the children of Abraham who are from many different nations of the earth. And so we thank you that today the gospel has come to us on the other side of the world, that we too might confess the name of Jesus and trust in him as our good shepherd. And we pray that that message of the gospel would sound forth uh, throughout every community around the world, that Christ's glorious name would be upheld by, by many. And we pray, Lord, that you would draw uh, men to yourself. We thank you for those whom you've called to serve in the ministry of the gospel. And we pray that you would sustain them and uphold them in their life. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, bless our brother Mark Winder as he serves Colliersville, Tennessee. We thank you for his church. We pray that you would continue to bless and provide for them as they consider a new meeting place. We pray that you open up an opportunity for them. Uh, bless his uh, contacts that he has through his doctoral program. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless those to the salvation of many. Lord, we pray that the women's Bible study uh, would continue to thrive and reach out to others. We pray for your blessing on them. Father, we pray for uh, the work of the gospel in the Middle East. We thank you for the Middle East Reformed Fellowship and for the contacts that they have in Cairo, Egypt. We pray, Lord, for your church there that is undergoing uh, oppression and persecution. We pray that you would protect and defend your people. We pray that you would restore their lost property uh, and, and uh, Lord, we pray that they would be established and protected by the new government. We pray that you would defend them from harm and those who seek to destroy them. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on our missionaries. Father, we pray that you would bless our own congregation and minister to our needs. We pray that you would provide jobs and work for those who need work. We pray that you would prosper us in our jobs, help us to provide for our homes and our families, for our church and our community, for the poor as well. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that we might be a light and a witness to our broader community of how the gospel transforms and blesses and provides for people. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, protect our elderly. We pray that you would sustain them in life. Be with Margaret Daniel, protect her, keep her from falls. We pray the same for uh, Avis and for Eve. We pray that you would sustain these ladies. Be with Ella McLaren, too, and watch over her health. Pray for George McLaren. Pray that your blessing will be on his health. And we thank you for Larry, and we pray that you would protect him. We thank you for these who have uh, 
reached a great age, and we pray for your blessing on them, that they would continue to live by faith, trusting in you, resting in your promises, uh, delighting in your word. We pray that you would encourage them by the fellowship of your people and minister to their every need. We thank you for our children. We pray for your blessing on them. We pray that uh, they would grow in their faith and love for you. We pray that you would defend them from harm and from evil. Teach them the scriptures, O oh Lord. We pray that you would help them to walk with you. We thank you for our church. We pray for your blessing on this ministry, and we bring these requests to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Final hymn this morning, number 316. Savior again, to thy dear name. Number 316, and we'll stand to sing.